<laughs> One last question, then. Somewhere here. Thanks. Um, sorry, just on the subject of, of saving E.M. Forster, although not in the religious sense, <laughs> um, Forster wrote in Howard Zinn that truth being alive was not halfway between anything. It was only to be found by continual excursions into either realm, and though moderation is the ultimate goal, to begin with it is to ensure sterility. And it strikes me that one of the problems that secular society, and in particular militantly secular society, has had is with a failure of imagination, a failure with its own imagination. When it threw out the, the beautiful liturgy, the poetry of the King James Bible, it didn't replace it with anything else. And we're now left with almost this Dawkinesque, atomistic, reductivist society. And if we are intent, as, as Christopher is, in, in being anti-theistic, in, in creating a society whereby we don't bow to the theism of the external God and we care about you know, the internal uh, humanity, how can we infuse secular society with the poetry and the liturgy to make people care about each other in, in, a, in, in an almost religious notion. Thank you. Secular, yes. no, a I, failure of the imagination. I think, I think it's fair to say almost every failure of humanity is a failure of imagination to some extent, a failure to penetrate the minds of others. I, there's a, what you were saying reminded me a little of a line of G.K. Chesterton's that uh, the trouble, he was of course a religious man as we know, and um, not a, an entirely nice one, but he did say some very good things. And one of the things he said was the trouble with uh, atheism, as far as he was concerned, is when you stop believing in God, you don't believe in anything. You don't believe in nothing. You believe in, in anything. And, and perhaps we do live in a culture where uh, reason and so on are, are, are not, you know, not glorified uh, uh, and, uh, if, <laughs> at the risk of saying it, deified, as, as perhaps they should be. However, I don't think we should ever allow religion the trick of maintaining that the spiritual and the beautiful and the noble and the altruistic and the morally strong and the virtuous are in any way uh, inventions of religion or particular or peculiar to religion. It's certainly true that you could say the Christ who said, um, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, that's a wonderful thing to have said. Anybody who said that one would earn a great deal of respect and interest. You'd say, well, that's, that's a, one of the most beautiful <laughs> phrases ever, uh, ever uttered. Um, but there is no, absolutely no monopoly on, on beauty and truth in, in religion. And I suppose one of the reasons that I'm so fond of the Greeks and one of the reasons that the great radical and poet Shelley wrote his Prometheus Unbound is because he understood that if you were to compare the Genesis myth, which, is, which had bedeviled our culture, the Western European culture, for a very long time, indeed for 2,000 years, it was essentially a myth in which, uh, in which we should be ashamed of ourselves. God says, who told you you were naked? What possible reason have we to believe that we are naked or that if we are naked, there is something to be ashamed of? That what we are and what we do is something for which we should ever apologize. We should apologize for our dreams, our impulses, our appetites, our drives, our desires are not things to apologize for. Our actions sometimes we do apologize for and we excoriate ourselves for them rightly. But that's the Genesis myth. The Greek myth of Prometheus who stole fire from heaven and gave it to his favorite, immor his favorite uh, mortal, man. In other words, the Greeks were saying, we have divine fire. Whatever is divine is in us as humans. We are as good as the gods. The gods are capricious and mean and foolish and stupid and jealous and rapine and all the things that Greek mythology shows that they are. And that's a much better explanation, it seems to me. And for that, the gods punished Prometheus and chained him to the Caucasus and vultures chewed away his liver every day as it regrew because he was immortal, of course. And, and, and Shelley quite rightly understood, and interestingly his wife, of course, wrote Frankenstein as the modern Prometheus, understood that that mythological idea, the champion of a real humanity and a real humanism, as we've come to call it, is that we are captains of our soul and masters of our destiny and that we contain any divine fire that there is divine fire that is fine and great. I mean, it's perfectly obvious that if there were ever a god, he has lost all possible taste. I mean, you've only got to look, forget the, for, forget the aggression and the unpleasantness of the radical right or the Islamic uh, hordes to the east, um, the sheer lack of intelligence and insight and uh, 
ability to express themselves and to enthuse others of the priesthood, the clerisy here in this country um, and indeed in Europe. God once had Bach and Michelangelo on his side. He had Mozart. And now, who does he have? People with ginger whiskers and tinted spectacles who, <laughs> who reduce the glories of theology to a kind of that's sharing. Okay. You know? That's, <laughs> that's what religion has become, a feeble and anemic um, nonsense. Because we understood that the fire was within us. It was not in some idol on an altar, whether it was a gold cross or whether it was a Buddha or anything else, that we have it. The fault is in our stars, but also the glory is, is in us, not in our stars. The glory, anything... We take credit for what is great about man and we take blame for what is dreadful about man. We neither grovel or apologize at the feet of a god or are so infantile as to project the idea that we once had a father as human beings and we therefore should have a divine one too. We have to grow up, which is partly what Christa was saying. Shalom. That is the most wonderful tribute to the human spirit. I use the word spirit.